My name is Emil Ollenberg, and I'm the uh, CTO of uh, Bitcoin.com. And uh, today I'm going to talk about colored coins and tokens on the Bitcoin Cash uh, blockchain. Originally, I was planning on explaining all the different use cases on what you can do with tokens. Um, but after the, uh, the debate that was online um, regarding the op group proposal, I decided to instead explain the more basics on how the protocol actually works and then have some examples and use cases. Um, so first of all, what is a colored coin? Uh, what is a token? Uh, there is no consensus really on what the colored coin, what, what, on the definition of colored coin. Uh, originally, uh, the idea was that you would color a UTXO and say like this output is green, this output is, is yellow, and then you would change the fungibility, uh, prop, um, the, fun the fungibility uh, functionalities in transactions. Um, because, but this idea was not really well received by the uh, Bitcoin core developers. So people started using and building uh, protocols on top of Opperturn instead um, because people realized that the like, colored outputs was not going to make it into Bitcoin core. And the Opperturn protocols allowed for uh, more experimentation and um, you can do more things uh, with the, the protocol. I would say, though, that since the op return is not a spendable output, it's technically not really a colored coin. The way I see it, a real colored coin is a colored output that you can spend. Um, so, So the op group was proposed by Andrew Stone uh, from uh, Bitcoin Unlimited. And the first property of the op group uh, protocol is the, the group address. So we have a hash 160 uh, that is the serialization of a pay to public key hash and a, or a pay to public script hash. Um, the hash 160 needs to be the same as the miner, uh, as the minter that created the token. Um, since we don't know if the creator of the token was using a pay to public key hash or a pay to public script hash, it makes sense to use a completely different format to serialize the whole group address. Because um, when you, from an interface point of view, when you build a wallet, you need to present to the user in some way that this is a token and the token has this address, uh, or this, the token has the, belongs to this, this group. And by giving each token group its own address format, the user will be very, uh, can very quickly identify that this belongs to, a, this is a token. So if, so, if we, if we check the, uh, the example here of the group address, uh, in my example, when I'm using the legacy, I'm, in this example, I'm, gonna use, I'm using the legacy uh, format because it's shorter, makes it easier when you make a presentation. Uh, but see, if, since it starts with a T, you know immediately, like, okay, this is a token group. So any, bal any balance I have in this T address means that that is a token. Um, so let's uh, run through the, uh, the op group uh, pretty quick. Um, all, all the new op group properties are in blue and the black text is the, the, normal, the normal script. So you start by putting um, for you start by putting data, which is the group address, which is just a hash 160. Uh, then you put the value, how many tokens there are, and then op group, uh, which is still a no operation op code. Uh, it doesn't do anything, but it helps 
the um, it, ha it helps the the node to understand that ah this is a token, um, and then you have two drops to make sure that these two data to the, to make sure that the data that was pushed to the stack is ignored and doesn't actually affect the the script evaluation. So this is where it gets this is where it gets a little hairy. Uh, because it's an opcode, that is not an opcode. It doesn't do anything. It's a useless opcode. Um, and it did cause some uh, contention uh, because some people think that, well, this is not really good practice. Um, because when this was reviewed as an opcode by an opcode workgroup, an opcode workgroup, their task is to review opcodes. But here we have an opcode that doesn't do anything, that is not really an opcode. So, like, if you only look at it as an opcode, well, it, it looks kind of awkward. It's more like 1% opcode and 99% consensus layer. So, op group, despite having the name op in it, should, should be really viewed as a consensus change and not really a, an opcode per se. Um, it would add native layer one tokens to Bitcoin Cash that is supported by every wallet, but it also has to be, has to be supported by every wallet. Um, it is possible to have a limited supply or unlimited supply um, up to a certain point, depending on uh, like how big variables you want to use. And in the first uh, and one thing that's important to mention is that the first proposal uh, was one token was pe is pegged to one Satoshi. Uh, it has been updated since then, so that's no longer the case. Um, so if you only look in the opcode domain, there's only, the, the change is very small, it's tiny. The only change that an op, that an opcode uh, workgroup would review is that op, no op seven, should be renamed to op group. That is the only change in the op code domain. The rest is consensus. Uh, so why do we use a lame duck op code anyway? Well, the Bitcoin transaction lack fields for putting extra attributes in the outputs. You cannot put random data in the output. Uh, without making it an op return, which is not a spendable output. Uh, the only way to put extra data in an output without a hard fork is to put it in the script. And it's not a perfect solution, but it's the smallest change possible. Um, of course, some argue that there would be better to uh, change the whole transaction format and to be able to put uh, additional data in the transactions, but that would be a whole remodeling of the transactions. And if we do that for the sake of adding tokens, then a lot of people would, would say like, hey, but I have this proposal. Can't we just add my idea to, the, to this change? And then suddenly would have like 100 suggestions on what to do. It will be a very long process. It would take a year to like for the community to decide on a spec, and maybe it could make it in like the May 2019 hard fork, maybe. And, but also, if you change the whole transaction format, you don't really want to add new features, because when you, if you bump the version and completely redesign the whole, the whole transaction format, um, it's, it's good practice to not add new features. You have to have the exact same features, and not change anything, which would mean that, well, if we, if we manage to do that for May 2019 hard fork, well, then we couldn't really add tokens until November 2019, so it would take forever to add the functionality that we want. So using a lame duck opcode is, is a, a more pragmatical solution, and it's not dangerous, it doesn't break anything out or anything. It just puts additional data in the transaction. And when you serialize it, like when you get the JSON serialized 
data from a block explorer, block explorer API, it will look the same. Even if we change the transaction format or we add the data in the script, the serialized JSON data that you will get back from Bitcoin D or a, or a blockchain explorer API, it will look the same. It wouldn't really be, wouldn't, wouldn't be diff any different. So I think this is the, probably the, the, the best solution for it. So why do we need native tokens anyway? Well, um, a layer one token would be minor validated, which means that every wallet can trust that the transactions included in, blo in the blocks, that would, oh, which means that every wallet can trust the transactions that are included in the blocks, which makes it possible for SPV wallets to trust tokens sent to them. Um, it means that every wallet can add the functionality, which is very important here. Um, it would not be possible with an op return protocol. But it also has a downside. It also means that every wallet must implement it. Um, every wallet would be required to handle tokens in some way um, because if they're sent unsolicited tokens or if they have sent tokens and the wallet tries to spend these outputs in an invalid way, suddenly an, un, an unupgraded wallet would not be able to broadcast these transactions to the network because the input contains a token and, it's, uh, it's, and the transaction format is in a way that would make the nodes reject it. Uh, also, the, the native tokens would probably be the only token protocol that would be accepted by hardware wallets. Um, if, if we're gonna have a token economy on Bitcoin Cash, and we're gonna have companies or who knows, even central banks printing tokens and putting it on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, they're most likely wanna do that with hardware wallets, have multiple hardware wallets for, for multisig. And for, for the op return protocols, I'm not that sure that Ledger or Tresor or the other ones would really bother to implement their op return protocol. Uh, they're way more likely to have full support for a native token. Um, also, we, we don't risk getting, uh, you, we don't risk having users which would end up with uh, tokens in their wallet that they can't spend. With a op return protocol, if tokens are sent to an SPV user, uh, then they can't spend it. The only way they will be able to spend it is that if they take the private key from their SPV node, then put it on a full node, then they can spend the token that was sent to them if it's arbitrary. With native, that's not a problem. Um, a native token would also be, uh, yeah, a, a native token would also be more decentralized um, since full node, since uh, all full nodes on a network would support it and forward them, and instead of a few patched full nodes. Um, I don't really have any numbers, but I suspect that very few people hold their tethers on their own full nodes or have tethers on their phone, because uh, you can't. You need a full node to save your tether, which means that most people that hold tether, USD tether, they only keep it in an exchange. That's not very decentralized. Um, and, and also, the, uh, since native, native tokens is using the, the scripting language to issue and burn tokens, uh, issuing these tokens will always be as safe as the Bitcoin scripting language. If we know that the Bitcoin scripting language is safe, then issuing these tokens is also safe. It, is, it cannot be more insecure than the scripting language itself. So let's explain, uh, let's run through some examples on how a transaction would look. Um, the rules are pretty simple. Uh, let's start with the sending transaction because that's, that will be the most common transaction on a network and 
some wallets will probably initially only be able to han handle sending um, and maybe not uh, bother implementing the, the whole minting and melting process. Uh, the input value and the output value must be balanced. So in this example, we have uh, one input, one purple input and one purple output. They both have, they're both sending 1,000 tokens. Uh, so this would constitute a valid transaction because the input and the output are balanced in value. Um, if you want to send uh, your friend 500 tokens and then you need to send the other 500 ones back to yourself, since Bitcoin is still the UTXO-based, uh, unlike Ethereum, who, who, which doesn't use UTX, UTXO in the same way, or at all. Um, if the if the values, if the token values of in, if the input, if in inputs and outputs are not balanced, the transaction is not valid. So here's an, here's an example of an invalid transaction. Uh, this one is invalid because the user is trying to, so it has the input is 1,200 tokens, but the output is only 1,000 tokens. Um, so this would not be valid. So in this case, the miner would not take 200 tokens. Uh, the miner will, cannot take tokens as fee. So this would just be an invalid transaction. Um, nor, would the, nor will the tokens be burned. Uh, so this, this transaction would just be rejected by the network. Uh, this is to make sure that only the issuer can destroy the tokens, so users cannot accidentally destroy tokens on their own. Uh, one thing to point out, though, is that this transaction will be valid today. This transaction, this kind of transaction can be mined today on the Bitcoin Cash Network. It, it will be classified as non-standard, but it would be valid uh, because we haven't, because we, because the, the protocol, uh, because we haven't activated the, the soft fork for this yet. Um, for minting and creating uh, new tokens, the output group address must be the same, must have the same hash 160 as the input. Uh, it can be minted to any address. So for example, here we have the, so in the, I have the hash 160 in purple, purple color, and I have the token group in green color and the pay to public key hash address in orange. If you, can, if you can see the color. Yeah. Um, the input is sent from the orange address, and it's, put, and it's being sent to a completely different address. But the token group is the same, it's the green one. So the orange address and the green address, if you take out the hash 160, that they will be the same. It will have, they have, will have equal hash, which means that this is a valid minting, this is a valid mint transaction. New tokens are created. Uh, as, for mel as for melting or destroying tokens, um, only the issuer can destroy tokens. So in this case, if you want to destroy the tokens, you need to first send them back to the address that created them. And then, from the address that created those tokens, they need to send the tokens into nothing. So, in this case, you see that in this, and, uh, in this transaction, the, the input and the outputs are not balanced uh, token-wise. So, if the issuer is sending two million tokens, has, the input is two million tokens, but the output does not contain any tokens at all, so two million tokens are just destroyed here. Uh, and this is a, an example of how the wallet UTXO set could look like. So the total balance of this wallet is 1.0401 BCH. Um, the wallet has six outputs, and two of them is just normal Bitcoin Cash, um, outputs, and you see that four of them uh, contains tokens. So three of them 
uh, contains the th three of them, which con constitutes around 200 million tokens, uh, belongs to the group TDZ, uh, while, while uh, over 9,000 tokens are sitting in the, in, the, in the address 13Y, uh, belonging to the group address TCW. So it still uses the UTXO set, um, just like Bitcoin has always done, but some UTXOs are colored, which is why it's called colored coins, but it's actually colored outputs that we're talking about. And uh, each output, they still have a, a Bitcoin cash balance, but they could also have a token balance. So one output can have two different balances. Um, this is just a start. Like this change is, is tiny, it's pretty small. It's like 50 lines of code. Um, it's a small change and it couldn't get included in the hard fork because of time constraints. So it will definitely make it into the next hard fork in November. Uh, we will uh, work very hard to make that happen. Uh, the biggest challenge is, as usual, is always the user experience and the user interface. Um, writing the code for, for, the, for the miners and the nodes, that's the easy part. Updating the wallets to have great user experience, that will always be the biggest challenge. Uh, also, exchanges will need to handle tokens in some way or, or the other. Even if they're not trading tokens, the exchange wallets needs to handle the tokens um, because what happens if someone just sends a token through their exchange wallets? Well, they want even if even if they can't trade it on the exchange, then they need to get it out. So the the exchanges they need some time to update their code and make sure that um, users can deposit and withdraw uh, tokens because you're still sending tokens to a normal Bitcoin address. Um, which it will lead to some headache for exchanges, uh, but it, it's it's still like not a not a huge change. Uh, we still need some API services and block explorers for advanced users and issuers and, and for and people that are plan to mint a lot of tokens or uh, ICOs who want to pay out dividends to shareholders. They probably need to rely on more advanced API services that have a full log of every token holder for every block. Um, but uh, th that's only needed for, for, the, for the more advanced users. Uh, most people, they just want to hold tokens, they want to spend tokens, and they want to send tokens. Um, I have more slides, but it's probably going to take uh, 15 more minutes. <laughs> Is that okay? Or uh, we're, we're behind, so five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, I can just. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody got that. Did everybody get that? <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I was just going to mention that um, exchanges will will kind of have a headache when uh, uh, so. If, if ICOs are going to pay out dividends, then most of the tokens will probably sit in exchange wallets. Like if Bitcoin.com Games, for example, would issue, uh, would issue shares for their service and pay out dividend, then most of this dividend would probably go to big exchanges like CoinEx or Binance. And these exchanges, they need to have a good plan on how to handle that uh, to make sure that their users get paid the dividend. Uh, I don't think I have time to explain that. Uh, there are a lot of other things that we need to consider for, uh, for the tokens. Uh, the BIP70 protocol should be ex probably be extended to include uh, group addresses. Um, if a fiat token emerges, uh, like Tether, then some merchants could possibly want to accept this uh, as payments using the BIP, uh, the BIP 70 pro payment protocol, or uh, if Amazon would issue uh, their gift cards as tokens, they would want to accept these gift cards as payments. 
so we need to extend the, the Bitcoin URI standard. And so if I'm shown if I'm shown a QR code on Amazon, then I and I scan it, then my wallet needs to know that aha, I can only send then my wallet needs to understand that it can only send Amazon gift cards to this address. So um, there's a lot of a lot of things that we need to uh, that can come after uh, the the uh, consensus wise. This is pretty easy, um, and the community needs to uh, to work hard to to uh, build out the user experience, the user interfaces to make people, make this usable for people. Um, the specification is not completely decided. Uh, it can still be improved and changed a little, but uh, it's, it needs to be settled very soon so all the uh, different wallet developers and exchanges know, uh, will have months to prepare uh, so they know exactly uh, what to do before the hard fork and make sure that everything is is ready before the hard the, the hard fork where we activate this um, and yes one uh, another important thing is that in this example I was using hash 160 we don't need to use hash 60 we can use sha256 <coughs> to mitigate the birthday uh, attack problem uh, this would lead lead to longer addresses but since the cache address format is extendable, uh, and then that's not a problem. The, uh, the addresses will just be slightly longer. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have time for just one question. Do we have one question for ML? All right, let me get your mic. Hey, thanks for the, the talk. Um, one question. Hmm? No, no, you can go stand there. Okay. You sort out your thing. Um, how, what what happens if we're paying to actual addresses? What happens when the Bitcoin at that address is insufficient? Um, you know, below the dust limit or something such that you actually can't. You don't have enough Bitcoins there to pay out. Um, that therefore you can't actually move your tokens out. How, how do you handle that? Do you, need uh, you you need to refill your wallet with fresh, vanilla Bitcoin cash, in to be able to spend it. Because the most important thing is that the token value is the token value is balanced in the transaction. So you might need to, uh, to send more Bitcoin cash to your wallet to be able to get them out. Thank you. Let's give it up for ML. Thank you very much. <laughs>